FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is March 6th. 2017. Well, gold is down a bit. It's about 3 p.m. Eastern time. Oh, by the way, we start that idiotic ritual again, meaning rolling back the clocks, trying to make up for lost time, which it isn't really lost and we'll never make up for it anyway. That's this weekend on the 12th. So get ready to have your sleep cycles disrupted. But in any event, the gold cycle will down seven dollars and change the last time i looked but we'll look again before because person you're about to hear from things like that actually matter to him and uh, talking about craig hemke aka turd ferguson tfmetalsreport.com and if you have any questions comments etc send me an email kl at kerrylutz.com kl at kerrylutz.com craig welcome back hey Kerry, good to visit with you again as always, so interesting things taking place on the, in the world, throughout the world. I won't even get into the whole Trump thing, but it but, uh, looks like we hit a little intermediate peak in precious metals prices. little pullback. The stocks uh, basically uh, broke down a couple weeks before the metals did, which is exactly what we've all come to expect. Yeah, it's uh, all part of what we've been dealing with for years. I call it the paper derivative pricing scheme where price is discovered not through the trading of actual metal itself. Nobody ever actually says how much we give you, you know, for my <laughs> physical metal. It's always no. uh, the paper derivatives that determine the price. Right. Well, why would you look to the price of the metal to determine what the price of the metal should be? <laughs> why would exactly. do that? Exactly. You know, I yeah. remember, Kerry, at uh, the conference that you held in Las Vegas a couple years ago, I, I got up and spoke about how uh, it's basically alchemy. You know, the, the central bankers uh, of the world, especially here in the U.S., in trying to defend uh, the dollar and gold standard all through the 50s and 60s, were losing physical gold hand over fist. And the U.S. took on that role in the 50s and lost about a third of their stockpile. So we shifted it to an international, um, I guess, d a group of defenders, uh, what we call the London Gold Pool. That worked for seven or eight years in the 1960s, and then it failed. But then the latest thing, which now has been in effect since the middle of the 70s, is this alchemy of paper or synthetic gold, allowing that to set price, because that's almost limitless how much synthetic gold has been created over the last 40 years. But it is the trading of those derivatives, that synthetic gold, that somehow sets price for the real thing. I, I don't, We'll see how much longer that can continue, but that is how it's done. Yeah, talk about the, uh, the tail wagging the dog, huh? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, I'll never like really understand what the heck this is all about. It just makes no sense to me whatsoever, but somehow it just keeps moving along. Yeah. We hope that, you know, the, the idea has been prevalent, you know, in my mind, on my side, you know, all through the, uh, the gold community for years that eventually there's going to be a failure that you can only lever up the physical ounce of gold so many times, you know, 10 times, 50 times, a hundred times. And nobody at this point has any idea how much gold there actually is with, you know, free, clear title to be delivered versus how many outstanding claims there are, be it in London or New York or, you know, these unallocated pooled accounts that are run in Canada and Australia and in Switzerland, places like that. And it's kind of a confidence game. You know, as long as the holders of the synthetic gold actually think it's gold itself and that, oh, well, I can always go get my gold whenever I want, then the game continues. It's when suddenly there's, oh, wait a second, I got to wait 90 days? You told me I could have it any time. You know, if suddenly two or three people show up at once demanding the same ounce of gold, that's when the thing begins to unravel. You know, like I said, we continue to wait for this to happen. But there are signs that, that things are pretty tight. And, I, you know, there are fundamental changes that have occurred here in the last several years that really impact that demand for the real physical, whether it's negative interest rates, whether it's the pending, it seems, dissolution of the euro currency. Uh, there are a number of things that could finally break, take us past that breaking point of this uh, paper derivative scheme. But until then we do get that breaking point, you know, it's the system that we're stuck with. And stuck with it, we are. <laughs> 
Yeah, no question about it. And and so we watch, you know, and and see how um, price moves. Again, though, understanding that the only thing that moves price is not so much the supply and the demand of physical metal. It's the supply and the demand for the derivative. And so we've got to have as price is set in New York and electronic trading most of the day, we've got to have demand for that COMEX derivative. And, and there, when there's periods of less demand, price goes down. When there's period of increased demand for the derivative, you know, wanting that gold exposure, price goes up. And as you mentioned, the last week has seen a drop off in demand just because, gosh, how things have changed in the last week. We've gone from a maybe a, a 30% likelihood of a Fed rate hike next week to suddenly a 99% likelihood of a Fed rate hike next week. And uh, and that suddenly has uh, been kind of foistered upon the gold market and all the markets, and they've reacted. And there's not a lot of demand, at least here today, for the gold derivative because, well, you know, the Fed's going to raise rates next week. But as we turn the corner, and if they do, in fact, hike rates, uh, then we get to this point, you know, maybe by later this week or early next, where people begin to anticipate where we go from here. Well, maybe this means the Fed's not going to hike rates now for six months. Maybe this means uh, maybe rising interest rates are actually been good for gold in the past. All these different things uh, begin to get factored into the equation. And, and uh, hopefully, as you said, this is just kind of a short term move in price in what will be uh, a pretty good 2017. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting here. I mean, I didn't feel that optimistic uh, for the past four or five years, um, with the exception of last year, which was a darn good year. Mm -hmm. up, up until December, which, right, you expect uh, December is to be bad now because uh, they want the end of the year to look bad vis-a-vis -vis all the other investments, right? Well, that certainly plays into it. And uh, it, it seemed like at the end of every quarter, you get some rather interesting action as the banks square their books and the trading desks, you know, square their books to make sure their bonus pools are nice and fat. What was there a story just last week at JP Morgan had only lost money like on two days of the last yeah. five years on their proprietary trading desk? <laughs> I mean, give me a break. Um, anyway, I, I think though, too, though, uh, Carrie, there's beginning to be, a, I don't know, I guess an understanding that is starting to work its way into the gold market, if you want to call it that, you know, because price can't came down rather dramatically in November of 2015, ahead of that first mm -hmm. Fed rate hike in uh, eight or nine years. And price bottomed the very next day after that FOMC concluded in December of 2015, and then went from what, 1050 to 1380 mm -hmm. before rolling over and going back down into the end of last year ahead of the second rate hike. And price bottomed and turned and went higher again the very next day after the rate hike going right. from 11.30 to, what, 12.65 last week. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going down again into what everybody thinks is going to be a rate hike next week. And so maybe we'll turn and head higher again as soon as the rate hike is behind us. At least that's what I'm starting to think is going to happen. Yeah. I mean, what would happen if they didn't raise rates? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true, too. That's true, too. But, you know, Carrie, the other thing, you know, a lot of folks um, are like me. I mean, I, I prior to 2007 or eight, uh, I didn't really give gold a whole lot of thought. I was trading commodities and, you know, trading stocks and things like that. But I didn't really uh, give the whole financial and monetary system a whole lot of thought. And then, you know, everything happened in 2008 and it's eye opening for just about everybody. And in the time since, you know, we saw gold and silver skyrocket in 2010 and through 2011 as uh, interest rates were coming down and the dollar was going down. Mm. And, and we all thought, well, maybe that's the only way gold can go up. Well, what's kind of forgotten in all of this is gold actually bottomed in about 2002. Mm -hmm. And between 2003 through 2007, that five-year period, it tripled mm -hmm. from about 300 to more than $1,000. And that was a period of what was perceived as being economic growth, interest rates were flat to higher. Um, the dollar actually was falling a little bit through that period. And that was a period that, that gold took off uh, and did quite well, obviously. And it was a period of uh, rapidly increasing U.S. national debt. So this idea that just because interest rates are uh, are trying to move higher, at least on the short end, is somehow a death knell for gold. You know, this gold is somehow going to back to $500. I mean, it just doesn't really fit the historical pattern. No, not at all. And everyone's trying to relive the uh, 80s there when interest rates went to 20 plus percent. And then you had a real interest rate of 7% or higher. Here, 
you're not going to have real interest rates going to 7%. I mean, I just don't believe that that's within the realm of possibility. So to think that uh, that the paper uh, returns on paper assets are going to rival what they were in the 80s, I rather doubt it. Yeah. Well, and you know, Carrie, you mentioned uh, earlier, you know, there, it's now just assumed that the Fed is going to raise next week. Uh, but I would point to the other side of that. I'd point out that uh, we haven't seen any other interest rates uh, really move at all. I mean, they're talking no. about raising that overnight rate, the Fed funds rate, by 25 basis points. But the last two times that they've done that, which again are the first two times they've done it in the last 10 years, but in the last two times they've done it, we've seen things like three month LIBOR move up 25 or 30 basis points before mm -hmm. the Fed hiked. Well, LIBOR is barely budged at all ahead of what is allegedly going to happen next week. And in fact, the time since we had the December rate hike, the two-year note, the 10-year note, and the 30-year long bond are actually showing a lower yield than they were 90 days ago. So it's again, it's not as if the whole yield curve is moving up, as you point out. And all we're really seeing is a flattening of the yield curve. And in a traditional economic sense, that's a precursor of recession, which means yeah. the Fed may have to turn around and start cutting rates again before too long. So it all kind of gets all back to this idea that, that this year is going to be a wildly unpredictable year. Uh, geopolitically, politically, economically, we got the elections in France coming up in a couple of months. Uh, we got it to leave as people yeah, call absolutely. it, Brexit, <laughs> Brexit, all this other stuff. We got North Korea shooting off missiles. We got the South China Sea. I mean, I could go on and on. Um, all of it augurs for a lot of uncertainty, not certainty. And in the end, that augurs well for gold. Yeah. Yeah. There certainly is a lot of instability in the world. And, you know, the strong dollar. I mean, what's your feelings on the so-called strong dollar and the, the way they keep jawboning it? I mean, it's... Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. And actually, I posted a chart on my site today showing that you know, the dollar index is about 101 and a half. Well, that's where it was a couple of weeks ago. That's where it was in early February. That's where it was in the middle of January. It's actually where it was in the middle of December. And 101 and a half is actually where it was about a week after the election of Trump. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of things that have happened now coming up on maybe a second interest rate hike. And the dollar basically hasn't budged at all. I mean, if I were long the dollar, uh, thinking that, you know, king dollar and then it's going to, you know, the index going to 110, you'd have to start getting pretty nervous here with all this happened and now maybe two rate hikes and yet the dollar hasn't budged. It's like this notion uh, that was put out at the end of last year. I mean, I couldn't, you couldn't go onto an internet site, uh, a financial site, not read about the bond bubble mm -hmm. and how the bond bubble was finally going to burst and that interest rates are going to skyrocket under Trump, under all this infrastructure spending and everything else. Yeah. But like I just said, that rates have moved down on the long end, not up. The bond market has firmed it hasn't sold off. And so this idea that the, you know, if you're a, a, a bond bear, if you think interest rates are going higher, I mean, you're mm -hmm. continually befuddled by this and it continually yeah. goes against you. I, I remember seeing back in January, the net positioning in, in treasury bond futures was the most short it had ever been mm -hmm. by speculators. Well, if anything should tell you which, you know, which way rates are going to go, it's the opposite of how those bets are placed. You know, when everybody's on the same side of the boat, it almost mm -hmm. market always, always goes the other direction. If anything, because if everybody's already sold, there's nobody left to sell and you're left with nothing but buyers. Yeah. And so I, I just think that the dollar bulls, the bond bears are going to continue to be confounded and astounded by the degree to which they're wrong as we go through this year. Agreed. Hey, you want to hear a great story about finding gold in a junkyard? They found the Ford Mustang that was used for, in the movie Bullet in a Mexican junkyard. Wow. Talk about finding gold in a junkyard, huh? <laughs> I would say so. Uh, oh, Steve McQueen God. probably rolled over in his grave, right? Yeah. Hey, man, I almost rolled over in mine. I'll tell you that. Jeez, <laughs> my future graveyard. Oh, my God. Ugh. Yeah. 50 years since that movie, that Mustang was last seen. Wow. Yep. One of two. Well, there were actually more than one used in the movie, obviously, because you bust up those cars pretty good and they modify them. Um, you can read about it. Uh, you can watch the chase scene. It's one of the best uh, movie car uh, chase scenes of all time, Hollywood chase scenes. So anyway, not to get too far off the site, off the subject, but, uh, you know, look, uh, you never know where the gold is going to turn up. That's, That's right. Point. That's right. It might just turn up uh, in China for all we know. Right? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> 
But uh, in all seriousness, something is going to give here. And we're getting to that point where, you know, they're just playing whack-a-mole. And, you know, where's the mole? Uh, where is he going to pop up next here? Right? Yeah. And, and, and to something we did address earlier, Kerry, the, the key will be whether these bullion banks can continue to supply the physical gold uh, into the market. Because it, again, this this paper derivative pricing scheme is basically a confidence game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of um, let's call it just in time delivery, right? Just like yeah. your grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> but anytime there's a blizzard yeah. or any threat to that delivery, and there's a rush to everybody wanting bread and milk at the same time, the, mm -hmm. the shelves get cleared out. Will these bullion banks supply physical metal into the market on kind of a just in time basis as well? But if there's ever a rush for physical metal, you know, be it, you know, a geopolitical event or like I said, I mean, if you're say you're a German citizen and you're faced not only with a dissolution of your currency, but negative interest rates, if you try to save in mm -hmm. said currency, well, why the hell do you want to hold euros? I mean, why wouldn't you own gold? Well, it doesn't pay a dividend. Well, that beats a pants off of a negative 2% dividend, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so if there's ever a rush, all at once for gold, it could crack the system just as you know, you're cracking the bread or milk system anytime there's a blizzard or a hurricane. So that's what we're waiting for. And um, again, I, I'm certain that that day is coming and you just never know how the events might play out here in 2017 that might make it sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I saw it firsthand uh, when we had that hurricane, threatened hurricane here in Florida, in South Florida, and you know, there was no gasoline in any of the stations. The uh, shelves of the supermarkets were just literally swept clean. I mean, it was really, Craig, it was amazing. Uh, you never yeah. saw anything like it. it really yeah, and was. again, that, that just-in-time delivery is a confidence game. You know, mm -hmm. you don't worry about how much milk or bread or gasoline you have if you know that, well, I can always just go yeah. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, but when there's a hurricane or a blizzard or whatever pending and you think, well, I can't go tomorrow, then everybody goes today and cleans them out. And that's yeah. what eventually will happen to gold, silver probably as well. Yeah. Um, this confidence game of, well, I can always go get my gold if I need it. I can always convert my dollars to gold as the system changes. Well, when everybody else goes to do it all at the same time, that's when the whole thing begins to crumble. Agreed. Hey, so website and tell us uh, signing up and all that tfmetalsreport.com is the site. We've been at this now for, oh my goodness, six or seven years. Long time. Uh, and you know, it's crazy. I mean, we've seen prices go up, come back down, go up, never been busier, never had more traffic, never had more subscribers than we have today. And uh, I think it's a testament to the people that are on the site more so than than what I do. I just kind of ride herd over the whole thing and and uh, and post some analysis every now and then. The, the main value of the site, I think, still comes from everybody that uses it. You know, and the willing uh, to sh willingness to share of everybody in the community and recognize we're all in this pot in this pot together, you know, trying to survive as uh, the global financial system is still roiling from where, you know, what happened eight years ago. We're all in this together trying to see our way through it. And I would just invite anybody to check it out. TFMetalsReport.com. Hey, absolutely. We are all in it together. So send us an email, kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com. And uh, we've got a Twitter feed, at Kerry Lutz, and the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Hey, Craig, it's always great speaking with you, and uh, we will definitely be touching base with you again soon. And I do have a feeling that 2017 is the start. I'm with you on that one, my friend. I look forward to talking to you again. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Um, I guess the, a group of defenders, uh, what we call the London Gold Pool, that worked for seven or eight years in the 1960s, and then it failed. But then the latest thing, which now has been in effect since the middle of the 70s, is this alchemy of paper or synthetic gold, allowing that to set price, because that's almost limitless how much synthetic gold has been created over the last 40 years. But it is the trading of those derivatives, that synthetic gold, that somehow sets price for the real thing. I, I don't, We'll see how much longer that can continue, but that is how it's done. Yeah, talk about the, uh, the tail wagging the dog, huh? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, I'll never like 
really understand what the heck this is all about. It just makes no sense to me whatsoever. But somehow it just keeps moving along. Yeah, we hope that, you know, the the idea has been prevalent, you know, in my mind, on my side, you know, all through the uh, the gold community for years, that eventually there's going to be a failure, that you can only lever up the physical ounce of gold so many times, you know, 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. And nobody at this point has any idea how much gold there actually is with, you know, free, clear title to be delivered versus how many outstanding claims there are, be it in London or in the derivative. And so we've got to have, as prices set in New York and electronic trading most of the day, we've got to have demand for that COMEX derivative. And, and there, when there's periods of less demand, price goes down. When there's period of increased demand for the derivative, you know, wanting that gold exposure, price goes up. And as you mentioned, the last week has seen a drop off in demand just because, gosh, how things have changed in the last week. We've gone from a maybe a, a 30% likelihood of a Fed rate hike next week to suddenly a 99% likelihood of a Fed rate hike next week. And uh, and that suddenly has uh, been kind of foistered upon the gold market and all the markets, and they've reacted. And there's not a lot of demand, at least here today, for the gold derivative because, well, you know, the Fed's going to raise rates next week. But as we turn the corner, and if they do, in fact, hike rates, uh, then we get to this point, you know, maybe by later this week or early next where people begin to anticipate where we go from here. Well, maybe this means the Fed's not going to hike rates now for six months. Maybe this means uh, maybe rising interest rates are actually been good for gold in the past. All these different things uh, begin to get factored into the equation. And, and uh, hopefully, as you said, this is just kind of a short term move in price in what will be uh, a pretty good 2017. Yeah, that's what I'm. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is March 6th. 2017. Well, gold is down a bit. It's about 3 p.m. Eastern time. Oh, by the way, we start that idiotic ritual again, meaning rolling back the clocks, trying to make up for lost time, which it isn't really lost and we'll never make up for it anyway. That's this weekend on the 12th. So get ready to have your sleep cycles disrupted. But in any event, the gold cycle will down seven dollars and change the last time I looked, but we'll look again before because person you're about to hear from things like that actually matter to him. And uh, talking about Craig Hemke, aka Turd Ferguson, tfmetalsreport.com. And if you have any questions, comments, etc., send me an email kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com. Craig, welcome back. Hey, Kerry, good to visit with you again. As always, so interesting things taking place on the, in the world, throughout the world. I won't even get into the whole Trump thing, but it but, uh, looks like we hit a little intermediate peak in precious metals prices. Little pullback. The stocks uh, basically uh, broke down a couple weeks before the metals did, which is exactly what we've all come to expect. Yeah, it's uh, all part of what we've been dealing with for years. I call it the paper derivative pricing scheme, where price is discovered not through the trading of actual metal itself. Nobody ever actually says how much we give you, you know, for my <laughs> physical metal. It's always no. uh, the paper derivatives that determine the price. Right. Well, why would you look to the price of the metal to determine what the price of the metal should be. Why would <laughs> exactly. do that? Exactly. You know, I uh, remember, Kerry, at uh, the conference that you held in Las Vegas a couple years ago, I, I got up and spoke about how uh, it's basically alchemy. You know, the, the central mm -hmm. bankers uh, of the world, especially here in the U.S., in trying to defend uh, the dollar and gold standard all through the 50s and 60s, were losing physical gold hand over fist. And the U.S. took on that role in the 50s and lost about a third of their stockpile. So we shifted it to an international New York or, you know, these unallocated pooled accounts that are run in Canada and Australia and in Switzerland, places like that. And it's kind of a confidence game. You know, as long as the holders of the synthetic gold actually think it's gold itself and that, oh, well, I can always go get my gold whenever I want, then the game continues. It's when suddenly there's, oh, wait a second, I got to wait 90 days? 
you told me I could have it any time. You know, if suddenly two or three people show up at once demanding the same ounce of gold, that's when the thing begins to unravel. You know, like I said, we continue to wait for this to happen. But there are signs that that things are pretty tight. And, I, you know, there are fundamental changes that have occurred here in the last several years that really impact that demand for the real physical, whether it's negative interest rates, whether it's the pending, it seems, dissolution of the euro currency. Uh, there are a number of things that could finally break, take us past that breaking point of this uh, paper derivative scheme. But until then, we do get that breaking point, you know, it's the system that we're stuck with. And stuck with it, we are. <laughs> Yeah, no question about it. And and so we watch, you know, and, and see how um, price moves. Again, though, understanding that the only thing that moves price is not so much the supply and the demand of physical metal. It's the supply and the demand for 